equilibrium theorems and linear response. So linear response is uh, so uh, uh, as you saw, linear response is when you say what happens to a system when I perturb it a little bit, and then I can I can use my equilibrium results to uh, compute. Um, using, uh, to compute how the system responds. And the correlations are the correlations. By the way, let me say once again something I said at the beginning. Um, note that there is an apparent uh, paradox, uh, which is the following. To derive the equilibrium theorems, I use that the system is in equilibrium and that its bath is a good one equilibrium one. However, it is not an equilibrium result in the sense that I can get rid of time. It's a, an equilibrium result that requires, uh, for example, the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem requires equilibrium. But it requires equilibrium dynamically, but it's not a purely static result. In other words, Statistical mechanics cannot tell me what C of TT prime is. Even if I know that I have a given temperature and that I am in equilibrium, statistical mechanics on its own cannot give me this. And the way to remember it is, imagine you have hard spheres in a box in space with no gravity and they are so you can calculate certain things, like the pressure, using statistical mechanics. Now, at exactly the same temperature or energy, you have the same system moving in water or in honey at the same temperature. Statistical mechanics do doesn't distinguish these quantities. The pressure is going to be the same because uh, Statistical mechanics only cares about the equilibrium distribution for the spheres. However, it's clear that the correlations in time is, are going to be different because they will move the spheres in a, in a different way. Or if you want even a, a simpler example, think of a system that is in equilibrium and you watch the film and you can compute certain things using statistical mechanics. Now, you take the same film and uh, you, you stretch time by two and then you, you divide all velocities or do something. Um, the, the, the dynamics can go faster, but the system is the same. So the correlations are going to see this, but the measure that happens at what temperature uh, there is a phase transition, for example, will not change. So um, it is important to see this because you see equilibrium also, so the, the main uh, good thing about equilibrium is that for certain quantities you can forget time. But those quantities are one-time quantities, magnetization now. For that one you can use statmec. But if you want the correlation between magnetization now and magnetization in a minute, it's different if it's equilibrium or not because I can use the equilibrium theorems, but equilibrium on its own doesn't give me that information. I have to solve the dynamics. Okay, that's one thing to... Now we're going to discuss a result that uh, is dates from the beginning of the 90s, and it is um, one of three or four results that are all very closely interconnected, and it's one of the... Uh, let's say, uh, remarkable results of out of equilibrium uh, dynamics. Um, so we're going to, I, I already mentioned it, we are going to for example, the original setting was, for example, I have a liquid, and I'm stirring it, for example, with a spoon. And, uh, or it could be 
I have a bar and I have a current that is going in that direct, mostly in that direction. Now, um, when I think of it, the easiest way to think of it is imagine that the, the liquid is made of very few molecules and you are turning and there is a thermal bath here. So you are turning and most of the time you are giving energy to the particles. We will see that this is what I have just said is the second principle of thermodynamics. If I disturb a system, it will cost me. The system is not going to give it to me. But every now and then, these molecules are going to bang against this uh, wheel. And uh, think of it, if I am not stirring, uh, the wheel will turn in one direction and, with, and the other, depending on the impact of the molecules. So now if I make a little force that wants to turn that way, uh, mostly I will have to force. But now and then, uh, so if there is no forcing, the, the force I will feel is something like this, no? But if there is forcing, I will be doing work, so let us do the distribution of work. But, you know, it's the same thing, but at a higher level, so this is time. And the quantity we are interesting, interested in the sign is conventional. For example, force times velocity, which is the power I'm putting into my system. In this case, it would be torque time angular velocity. And in this case, the current, again, if the temperatures are the same, because the electrons are moving randomly, with no difference in temperature, the current is going to be like this. And with a bit of difference in temperature, the current is going to do something like this. And this is also a situation where the fluctuation theorem will apply. So notice how strange. These are situations where for a brief time, the current is going, uh, the heat current, sorry. Heat current, let's denote it with a J so we don't confuse. But electric current would do the same. So for a short time, current is going in the opposite direction. And me, I am gaining energy from the system, which seems to violate the second principle of thermodynamics. <clears throat> the second principle says that if I am disturbing a system on average, it will cost me and not the system. If the system will not give me, I will have to give energy to the system. However, for very short times, the second principle can be violated. You will see that the fluctuation theorem tells you this nicely. In front of the integral, what is small t in Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you very much. So this is the temperature, which, and this is the time so that I get the average, no? The temperature is there because uh, you want something that looks like an entropy. So it's work divided by temperature. So, so you see, this is an, an average. So let us, for a moment, cancel this one. Although you can, I can give you a reference where this, is, this problem is studied. It's, it's technically the same thing. So the principle concerns strong, potentially strong forcing. So it's not a linear response. That's what is new. It's 
a strong force applied on the system. So it's a truly non-equilibrium thing. I am here in contact with a bath at temperature T, which is the temperature that appeared there. Coupled to this. And I am allowed to force a lot. It is strongly driven, that is, to the nonlinear response regime, but the number of degrees of freedom is fewer than, say, 10 to the 24, because we're well, using few particles. the principle, as we will see, uh, is holds for 20, 10 to the 24, but it's un, it completely irrelevant. I mean, it's unobservable. Why? Because the more particles you have, the more this thing averages out, and you see li less fluctuations. Okay, so... Remember the philosophy of large deviations. I want to find in an interval t the average of power. Well, it's divided by the temperature. So the, and so you see, one thing that happens is that if I consider an interval or a, or a much longer interval, it's like throwing a coin more times. So if I, I now do a histogram, probability of sigma, of, of that quantity, average, and uh, over um, sigma. And uh, as I said, the second principle says that mostly I have to give the system uh, energy. So this will give me something, which is the distribution here. not a Gaussian, something. But if I consider a longer time, it's like throwing a coin more times. So um, I will get something like this, more peaked. And even a longer time, I will get something even more peaked. So, uh, this we saw at the beginning when we were doing extensive quantities. Remember that if we can assume that the time can be broken into pieces that are independent, then the result is the product. So this suggests that the log of the probability of sigma is a quantity that is additive. And this one is going to scale. This one is going to scale nicely. So uh, this is the quantity I should plot. And um, Jorge. Yes. Tanaka-san here is feeling shy about asking a question. Yes. So I will ask it in his name. Name, yes. So he's asking, is this negative fluctuation like a negative temperature? No, no. You are at a good temperature, but it's working as if you had for a very brief time a negative temperature, but uh, it's not. The temperature is defined on average yes. of your baths. Um, like I meant, what I meant is like the derivation. Uh, when do when we do calculations, when we flip the system really br abruptly, we will, for short periods of time we will have a, a negative temperature. Uh, yes, but temperature is something defined on average, so we okay. we cannot say negative temperature. It's a negative entropy production. That's that's what okay. it is. Thank you. <clears throat> And sorry, and here we have to divide by the total time because we want it, uh, sorry, not here, here. We have to divide it by the total time because if not, we will see it peaked. Yes? What do you mean by negative entropy? Okay, so we, we, let's, uh, we, we've already seen it a bit, but let's think in very concrete terms. 
I am doing work on the system, I am stirring the system, when is it that I am giving the system energy, power, and when is it that the system is giving me? Now, there is the second principle of thermodynamics that says, but I, we will, this, the fluctuation theorem will have this as part inside it. Uh, the second principle of thermodynamics tells you that I, if I have a system that has a given temperature and I have the same temperature and I'm doing work on it, it's me who's going to do work on it. I cannot extract at the same temperature work. Although there is a lot of energy around, if I am at the same temperature as this room, I cannot extract energy. Is this true? This is important. That it is true on average, but during a millisecond, maybe I'm lucky, and 85 more molecules are crashing on my right side, and I get a little bit of energy. So, as you will see, now we're looking at large deviations. The second principle concerns the average, and, um, and we're going to see what happens as deviations of this. And you see that this is a function that is more and more p. So we said that p could be scaled as e to the t, and then a certain h, let's say, or whatever, of sigma. I don't remember what. So it means that this becomes more and more peaked as I consider longer and longer times. This is exactly because this experiment, if I consider more times, it's like, uh, if they are uncorrelated, it's like throwing a coin many times. This was the large deviation function. Okay, so now, uh, this is the quantity we should plot, which is H, by definition, and you get a kind of universal curve, okay? Which is just this curve, but now all these curves fall onto one another because they scale precisely in this form, so you get something like this, and then for this one, Mahesh can go more f further away because the system is smaller, so you get larger deviations. But they, with this scaling, they fall nicely onto a universal curve, which is for this H. I am sorry, I don't know if I used H, but for the notation. Okay, so what does, okay. So what does the fluctuation theorem tell us? It's the following. And for this one, I finish writing because I need your full attention. So, it tells us the following bizarre thing. I mean, normally, as a physicist, you would like to know how they deviate around the mean, no? This is the re reasonable thing to ask. Uh, but unfortunately, we have no theorem for that. What the fluctuation theorem tells us is that in this plot, if I look at any point here, and now I look at negative, the negative of that same deviation. Notice that it's around zero and not around the peak. This is the first question everybody asks because everybody reasonable in this world wants to know the deviations around the peak. But unfortunately, that's not what the fluctuation theorem tells us. And it tells us that P of sigma, sigma is this value, this is minus sigma, divided by P of minus sigma is equal to E to the No, this one is bigger than this one. I always get it wrong, so I know. Um, there is a T. The way I defined it is a T. Sorry? Yeah. 
No, no, no. P of minus, minus T H sigma. Ah, the way I defined H. Yeah, you define. Yeah. Yes, sorry, yes. The way What's I define uh, the way I drew it, it's, uh, it's with a plus, yes. No, I defined it sometimes with a minus. Maybe I did. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so before doing the calculation, the cal I will tell you the history of this, but ask me a lot of questions now. Then we will be drowned into a medium-sized calculation, so we better. Uh, let me say quickly that uh, for T1, T2, we say that T2 is greater than T1, and there is a current here. You can write also a fluctuation theorem. So the, the second principle says, if I'm doing this, the current has to go from high to low temperature. It also says that the probability of, of total energy going one way divided by the probability going in the wrong way is e to the minus total energy, just like this. It's always of this form, okay? The, t, the time here is because it's a time average quantity, sigma. Uh, time, whether it's here, it doesn't matter because it's divided top and bottom. So one question is um, about uh, so sigma t the way you define it is uh, it's a divided by the time yes huh? divided by the time it's also divided by the temperature yes yes it's also divided by the so time. it's a dimensional ah it's a dimensional sorry 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 thank you yeah. it is, it was divided by the temperature so uh, it's not there. sorry uh, sometimes here we put work if it's work you have to divide it by time if it's already divided by temperature. Can we get one more coefficient there? Nothing. Nothing. So first remark is this is not a property around the peak, which would be what we would like to have, but life is not so nice. Second thing is, this is completely model independent, totally, completely, absolutely model independent. I didn't say anything. The only thing I said is that this system is in contact with a thermal bath with temperature T. And this is a relation between how often I get a negative fluctuation and the corresponding positive one. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Like, uh, okay, the um, the equation makes sense because a negative entropy production is uh, exponentially exponentially less probable than a positive one. But like uh, you said, uh, fluctuation dissipation tells us this. But like, how can we get it even with without a full derivation? But like. Uh, I didn't get the question. Fluctuation? No, like uh, you said, the fluctuation dissipation tells us this relation. How can this we... This is not fluctuation dissipation. This is fluctuation without the word dissipation. Not to confuse. This is called the fluctuation theorem. Ah, okay. Okay, it's not oh, the fluctuation... so it's a theorem and... Uh... It's nothing to do with what we saw. Okay. Well, a little to do, but not directly to what we saw yesterday. Uh, sometimes people... Okay, I'll tell you a little bit the story of this. But let me say... So... This relation is completely independent of the system and the way you're putting energy. And it is also, when you have conduction of heat or electricity, it's, all, it's the same. Nothing of what is inside matters. And furthermore, you can make it quantum and it's the same.
So about the, uh, the probability distribution, uh, do you assume that uh, the probability distribution is a Laplace distribution or? Because I, is I, have, I checked the, the relation that you wrote. For, for that one to happen, we should assume that the P follow a Laplace distribution. Laplace? Yeah. Yes, yes, we, we, will, we will do something that is very much like a Laplace transform, but in a second. It's, okay. it's a technique of the proof. Okay. Yes, yes. But I want to explain to you the phenomenology, if you want, before going into embarking into a calculation. Yes. Um, my question is, please, I'm really confused about the way you draw the hedge. Because like we study it as a concave of function. For the free energy, which is minus h. So uh, when you have a free energy in probability, it's e to the minus the free energy, and yes. it's like this. But because I was told that I have to put a plus here, because this is the way I, I drew it, it's reversed. OK. But it is concave, you're right. You're right. And uh, should be below the Co axis. Convex, uh, sorry? It should be below the axis. Should be negative, because it's a probability. Probability. Uh, well, yeah, but this is a log. Uh, so, so this is why it can be. OK, this means that the larger t is, the more this thing dominates, because this is a universal function, but the time is larger. OK? So, um, OK. So uh, this, this result has a history more or less like this. Uh, there is an ancient result that of two Russian names, I'm sorry, uh, Kuzolev, I have it somewhere. Uh, nobody remembers that result, so some people mention it. Maybe I can find it. Um, Bochkov, Boch, Boch, Bochkov, Kuzolev, Kuzovlev. So I never read that paper, and nobody has, except people who are looking for who to attribute the first uh, theorem of this kind. Then uh, Australian people, Evans, well, Cohen is not Australian, was Dutch, and uh, the first and the last are Australian. Uh, sort of re rediscovered it, maybe made it more general. But these are the people who taught uh, humanity about this result. Uh, they were mostly numerical people, but they had understood, I think they have understood, that the main property that matters here, what is making this theorem, is time reversal, which is OK. Then uh, there was a famous paper Cohen is the same. Gallavotti, those of you from Italy surely know, which proved it in a context that uh, this is now, we are in 94, I think, uh, proved it mathematically in a, con in, a, in a very specific context, which is, the paper is remarkably hard to read. Uh, so I know one person who read it completely. Uh, for those of you who know him, Francesco. <laughs> and um, just for the, OK, it's, it's, it's tough. It's, uh, but it's, no doubt, excellent quality work. Um, in that paper, they did something important. They realized that there is some connection between the fluctuation theorem and the fluctuation dissipation we saw yesterday. Only that the fluctuation dissipation that we saw yesterday is for equilibrium, and this would be kind of a generalization out of equilibrium of the same thing. 
For this? Which one is the generalization of this? This one, this one, yes. Uh, this one is the generalization of, uh, of fluctuation dissipation, but applied to... Uh, uh, so then, roughly at the same time, uh, ah, because of this paper, it is common, especially in Europe, that people call this thing, and sometimes you will hear it uh, mentioned like this, as the Galavotti Cohen uh, theorem. Uh, okay, a name. So now, Jarzinski, who's American, despite the name, uh, found a different story, which I don't have the time to tell you, but very much on the same general frame. So the crucial element is time reversal and it involves uh, large deviations of something, okay? So you will see a lot of literature on the Jarzinski. Then, Crookes showed that these two, which came from, well, let's say, these two, that came from uh, different worlds, so, for example, Galavotti and Cohen didn't know anything about Jarzinski at that time. Uh, uh, they, he realized that they were more or less aspects of the same thing. We are going to see more like uh, this kind of thing. And then, uh, then it was shown for quantum, uh, etc. Uh, uh, my own contribution is to make a proof that is super simple. Uh, with stochastic uh, dynamics. And so for a lot of people, including myself, this was the first thing they understood of, of the subject. Um, OK. Um, very good. So sometimes you will hear it mentioned as the Galavotti coin. Sometimes you will be, hear it mentioned as simply the fluctuation theorem or fluctuation relation. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a similar subject. And then there is, starting from all these papers, which, well, the core of them was over by the 2000. There are 2,000 at least or more, oh, more like three or 4,000 papers, which is enormous for physics, uh, on this subject. Experimental, a lot. Um, various theoretical applications and different contexts. It, it, there is an enormous activity. Uh, but you see, this is, the result is this one. It is also sometimes said, called the probability of violation of the second principle. Because if I have a temperature gradient that way and I get energy going for some time in the wrong way, I am getting energy from, from the system in the middle. If I am uh, stirring water and for some time, short time, the water gives me back um, energy, I am, getting, I am apparently violating the second principle. Second principle says, but what does the second principle say? It says, on average over time, I, I will give to the energy to the system and not the inverse. So okay. the second principle, just a second, is not a statement that is absolute. It is a statistical principle. If you ask me, is it true during 10 to the minus 10 seconds that the air cannot give me energy, it is not true. For a very short time, it is rather possible that I get lucky impacts. It's on average over time that the second principle holds, yes. So, uh, isn't it that Jardzinski was about work? I mean, this, this yes. relation about work. Yes, it's a different context, but once you see the proof, it's the same things that are in play. In fact, Crookes made a point of view that puts the two together. 
They look different because the protocol followed is different, at least from an experimental standpoint, because Jarzinski requires that you go from uh, any, uh, an equilibrium state A to an equilibrium state B, relax the system there, and then bring it back. And you ask what is happening in the forward trajectory, backward trajectory, whereas Bochkov, Kozovlev, Evans, Cohen, Morris, Galavati, Cohen, they all are talking about stationary state dynamics. Exactly. Uh, uh, not only, uh, okay, but there is equilibrium. Uh, so, yeah, these are variants of the same. The proofs are all quite similar. The proofs are relatively easy. Imagine, I am going to do it now, and it's uh, a result uh, which are, is the most remarkable, if you, think, if you want, of the last 30 years of out of equilibrium, and yet we can do it in one lesson. Uh, if I would have to teach you in one lesson, the renormalization group, <laughs> it wouldn't be possible. So uh, this is a, a remarkable thing. Some people, okay, and what is the main crucial element is time reversal, ouch. Um, it's, it's, go it's going to be time reversal. Okay, questions on this? Ah, uh, why does this, have to do with the second principle, because you see it's telling you that the probability that you're on the right side, second principle, is um, very much larger, this is an exponential in time, than the probability you get a lucky violation of the second principle. Also, if the times I consider are larger, this becomes much more, this ratio becomes much rarer. So if this time were 10 to the minus 24, there is no problem of violating the second principle during 10 to the minus 24. For the reason I told you, in 10 to the 24, I get four impacts of molecules against my body, and the chances that uh, three of them give me energy and one take, takes it away is, 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 is something. If the time becomes large, as usual, it's like throwing a coin many times. The probability that I, am, I get lucky and 10 to the 24 uh, push me one way and give me energy and only 10 to the minus, I don't know what, uh, push me the other way, um, then it becomes like throwing a coin and getting heads 90% of the time. If you do it two, two times, it's, it's easy. If you do it, well, if you do it 10 times, it's easy. If, if you do it a million times, getting 90% of heads is very rare. You have to understand that the second principle is a statistical thing. The other thing that you see is that also the size of the system doesn't matter. However, it doesn't matter for this relation, but this curve will depend on the size of the system, the, the, the specific form of this curve. And uh, if the system is large, this curve is much more peaked because it's natural that if you have five molecules, the fluctuations are going to be large. If you have 10 to the 24, it's again like throwing a coin many times. Sigma. Uh, yeah. Per unit time, so yes. Okay. So um, I think that we are ready. One moment for a question. Uh, so if we draw a horizontal line on that P sigma curve, it will, in yeah it will intersect at two points, right? Let's say sigma one and sigma like two. This? Yeah. So I'm not seeing how the bottom relation will hold for both sigma one and sigma two. Oh, because this sigma one has to be compared with this one, and this one has to be compared with this one. Yeah, so on right hand side, P of plus sigma would be same, but P of minus sigma would be slightly different. Right. Yes, no. This this relation is 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 true. Or let me put it in another way: if if you if you take the log of this one, mm -hmm. and 
And now you, you do the h of sigma minus h of minus sigma, you get a straight line. Okay. It's purely linear. Okay. Um, you are saying if I am here, so that sigma here, well, it concerns, uh, yeah, uh, I get here. So it's e to the minus t sigma 1 here, the ratio, e to the minus t sigma 1. This is sigma 1. And here the ratio is e to the minus t sigma 2. Right. The other value. And so uh, these two will accommodate so that you get those two ratios. Um, but like numerators are same, precisely. Uh, but the denominators seem different because that curve is increasing. Yes. Then yes. How, how could the ratios be seen? Uh, they can, but <laughs> let me see. So the, you say that these two values are the same, but the two quotients give you the same, so these two are different. Okay. These, two, these two do not coincide as these two do. Okay, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So um, by this definition, it means that if we have a small measurement time, we can extract more energy from the system, but like in practice, how is this T defined? Because like, you can imagine if somehow you keep resetting the system really, really fast, you can extract a lot of energy. Good question. This, so what he's saying is, uh, can I be smart and look for these occasions and only connect on those occasions and not on the others? This is a variant, I think, what you're saying, or what's called a Maxwell demon. Uh, and the answer is subtle, given by Maxwell. Uh, the answer is that for you to have the intelligence and the information to do it, you are spending the energy, whatever. Uh, so uh, the explanation usually is that the little demon who is connecting and disconnecting gets gets hot himself, and then... Uh, yes, but basically, it all comes from something very subtle, that you have a tendency, and then when you do quantum mechanics, this becomes really serious, you have a tendency to think yourself as if you were out of the physical world, and you're observing something that follows the laws of physics. The moment you realize that your brain and you are also following the thermodynamics of the thing, uh, you realize that if you had described correctly your thermodynamics completely, then uh, the whole process would, would cost you. You cannot do it that way. Uh, to get out of this difficult state of mind, the best thing is to invent a mechanism that is simple, that does the demon, and then you realize that you lose where you gained. Okay, um, so let me remind you of what we said um, here about a large deviation and how it is um, done in general. Uh, so what am I going to erase? I think everything. So, two critiques of the fluctuation theorem, three, that have been made. The result is amazing. First critique, it's not about the center of the distribution. We have nothing to say about deviations around the peak, which would be much more interesting if there were a relation, but there isn't one. Second, it is super general, but when things are a bit too general, they stop being interesting because something you can say about everything begins to be 
a bit uh, insipid. So uh, that's one critique. It's so general that it then ends up by being non-informative. This is the other critique. And the third critique, which is implicit, and nobody says it this way, is that these relations are very in general. Charsinsky, Crookes, uh, Galavotti, Cohen, etc. Except for the paper of Galavotti and Cohen, they're all very quite easy to, to derive. Once you know what you want, they are quite easy to derive. So there, is a, there are people who say, how can this be brilliant if it's easy? Um, OK, this is a, a kind of prejudice, because sometimes you have to know what calculation you want to do. And then doing it sometimes is not the difficult part. The difficult part is having the idea. So I'm telling you this because uh, the attitude towards this theorem is variable. OK, so let us recap a little bit what we said of large deviations. So, um, so for example, imagine that we want an average quantity over time. In our case, it's going to be the power, but let's do it. So you have a fluctuating quantity, and you want an average over time. This is why I put the time here. So uh, how do I calculate this? Well, the trick, as we exactly like what we did when we went from canonical to microcanonical, as I told you, the trick is to put everything in the exponent. Just the same as we did for space, for the free energy, I'm doing now over time. And now we have to say, what is the dynamics of this? So, so this is P of A. No, sorry, this is not P of A. This is the delta, simply, that imposes this relation. Now, P of A is what? First of all, I have this integral that I just wrote. Uh, yes. Thank you. And now I have to say, what is this? So what is this? This an integral over all the possible trajectories, a sum over all possible trajectories of the probability of each trajectory, and then of this quantity that is here. So I'm just summing over all possible trajectories. This is just putting in, in maths what we are doing in words. So for every trajectory, so every realization of the noise, it will have a certain probability. And then I calculate this quantity along the trajectory, and I have to sum. And of course, in this, we have to say how we start, how we end the trajectory, and everything, on which ensemble of trajectories we're going to sum. And now, 
this is what we did more or less the first day where I, when I said to you that large deviations and the thermodynamic formalism are the same thing with time playing the role of space and additivity. Okay, so now the, the only new thing that will appear is that now that we know, we will imagine that the system follows the Kramer's equation, so, uh, and, I, and then I'll tell you why I'm choosing Kramer's and not Fokker-Planck. And then this quantity here, we can write it on the basis of the Kramer's thing. It's, remember that when we do something that is averaged over trajectories, we can use the Kramer's formalism for the probability. So this quantity here is in the notation, I'm going to decide to start with Gibbs. I think I called it like this. I decided that way, that we will start in equilibrium. And the probability of the trajectories is putting e to the minus thk as a, a, a Kramer's thing. But now we want to add this term that we are measuring a on each time. So this adds a term because now it's not only the probability of the trajectory which is given by this, but we have this thing. And this is taken into account by Probably there is a plus here. So there is a change in the operator that comes from the fact that this is the operator A, this is the operator H. And here we put all possible outcomes. And this is this term, not this one. And this one, because it's an extensive quantity in time, so it's additive in times. Again, we will assume that it's of the form some form of mu. This concerns only this piece. This is the part that depends on the system. So the passage of canonical, microcanonical to canonical, I did it exactly in the same way. I wrote the delta that imposes the microcanonical, and then I said things are additive in space, and so I suppose that there was a rule. Here it is exactly the same, but only that additivity is now in time. So if you want this would be kind of like doing thermodynamics in time and not in space. This is what large deviation. So, uh, sorry. Uh, um, so you are replacing uh, the integral between zero and t of a of t by t times the operator a, right? Yes. So I am replacing this thing, which is like measuring at each step, by putting it in the exponent, which does exactly the same thing. Measures. But shouldn't you have an integral also in that exponent? No, because the, the integral is here. This is time independent, A. And oh, okay, okay. If it depends on time, it's an integral, I agree. And so now, uh, now what do we get is the integral of d mu on the appropriate contour, e to the mu t a bar, and here minus, I'm taking the t outside, and here g of mu. g of mu, of course, is something that somebody has to calculate for you. So this is like in the analogy of canonical, microcanonical. This would be you fix exactly something, and uh, this would be like uh, what well, you will see.
And now, somebody calculated this for me, which I assume that it has the large deviation form. So this thing, because it's additive in time, uh, this, this part, I am assuming that it's proportional to t. And then just if you, you can go back to what we did uh, with uh, the microcanonical to canonical passage. Now, if the time is very large, I can solve this by saddle point, which means that I have to differentiate this, see where the derivative of this is zero, and so I get the, for large t, that point will dominate, so the point that will dominate is in the appropriate value of mu. So this is playing the role that in thermodynamics is played by temperature. This is playing the role that the size plays in thermodynamics. This all together is the microcanonical role, the role that the microcanonical measure. And this thing here with a G only is what we would call canonical, sort of. I mean, I'm using an analogy. Nobody calls this canonical, but it's a conjugate uh, function. What did I do wrong? So the important thing to bear in mind is that doing large deviations is the same as doing the thermodynamic limit. In the first case, it's in time. In the second case, it's in space. I didn't get that part, like when you write e to the power minus t h k, that cramp, how you introduce that h k from that? Because we point. learned two days ago that if I want to generate the probability of all trajectories and sum over them, mm -hmm. I get the cloud that is propagating, and that this cloud of probability, let's say, that is propagating is given by h k. This is what HK does for a living, uh, transform and time uh, the probability. And what about that uh, integral of dt prime, at prime? This one? Yeah. OK, so the cloud is transported by HK, OK? And at each very short time, I measure A in order to calculate this integral. Mm -hmm. Yes? So to switch between a little evolution and a measurement, a little evolution and a measurement, a little evolution and a measurement, is the same as doing the, the two things together. So this is how I construct this. I am telling you in words, there is a construction that can, you can do more, a bit, well, not rigorously, but more completely with uh, the path integral uh, representation of this, but I don't want to get into that. But suppose A is very, very much fluctuating. No, no, A, yes, A is fluctuating, yeah. but that's not taken into account. It's taken into account by the probability of the trajectories. And that is what HK with its distribution is doing. Okay. So the fluctuations of A that you see here is simply taking A and measure it with a, with a, with a, with the probability distribution of the trajectory, but HK generates that. So this is how the fluctuations disappeared. This is the operator A added to the operator HK. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, I don't get how you got to the violet part. Did you just like do the brackets and sandwich stuff? Yes, okay. I asked somebody to calculate this. Oh, okay for my model, this depends on the model, and the only thing I assume is that the scaling form of this is of this form. That's the only assumption. Now, what, why am I assuming this? Because I see what it is, and I see that it is something that it's uh, um, a longer trajectory, a sum over things where the times add. So I, I say, okay, this is like throwing a coin many times, and then it's a product, and then in the exponent is a sum. Right. Um, this is what you call normally the large deviation form or the Kramer function. This is the assumption. 
Of course, the form of G, somebody has to give it to me. And the other thing that I think you were going to say, I don't know if you are, uh, why you chose Kramer and not Fokker Planck. I, I understand ah, why yes. you chose Kramer. Yes, I'm going to Kramer. say it to you now, if you want, is that I will want to use for my A the power, you know, because we are talking about power. And remember I told you that Langevin, which gives you Fokker Planck, because of the way it's done, where you have a Q dot and there is a white noise, the velocity is really badly defined. Remember that to do this, I threw an inertia term. And so what happens is that when I look at the velocity, this one really doesn't exist. And so it's tricky to find force times velocity when the velocity doesn't exist. You can do it. You can do it. Um, and then you get into the troubles that I told you about Ito, Stratonovich, and things that you don't want to know at this stage. So um, instead, when you leave this thing here, then eventually you can take it to zero. But if you leave it, then the velocity is well defined. OK? So this is why Kramer's is cheaper in this case. Anyway, what we're going to use of Kramer's is very little. Okay. Uh, uh, so this it has to do with uh, equilibrium situations only, or from like the Gibbs uh, uh, measure. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I am starting in equilibrium. Okay. So uh, I have to go back to history. And let me say, these guys, I don't know Boskov and Kuzolev because as I told you, I never read the paper. But these ones, uh, they did it for starting in equilibrium. Galavotti and Cohen instead did it for uh, a stationary state, whatever it is. So this one starts in equilibrium, but then you're forcing it. So you're kicking it out of equilibrium, this one. And it's the easiest one to prove. So we start with Gibbs, and then we uh, will apply some H, will contain some forcing. And uh, uh, OK. Uh, so Galavotti and Cohen did it uh, in a way that uh, you are in a stationary state but there is no equilibrium. You, you were forcing it since time equals minus infinity. While in this one, this is called a transient because you start in equilibrium and then you apply the forcing. And uh, technically, it's much easier. Uh, you will see. It's very easy. The merit of Galavotti and Cohen is that they say, no, I apply F, the forcing, at minus infinity, and then I'm in a stationary state. So does this make the proof difficult? It made their proof very difficult because they worked with a system that is with a very specific thermostat, the thermostat that I gave you. Remember the, the one that conserved the energy? It's a purely deterministic thermostat. So they had to deal with all the issues of ergodic theory and blah, blah, blah. And then the proof is very difficult. And then uh, me, and later on uh, generalized by Levovitz and Spohn, did it for a stochastic system like the ones we're looking. And the proof that was very difficult in Galavotti Cohen becomes almost uh, trivial, at least 
I mean, for the people who, I mean, you are students, but for the people who are uh, really into the job, it was very easy to read. Um, and in that case, when the system is stochastic, I am not going to do it, and I will begin in Gibbs, so I'm going to take the cheap way, but in the presence of a bath with noise, even the st stationary context becomes easy. So uh, putting noise into your situation makes life easy. And this is a generic thing of life. When you have a dynamical system and you add noise to it, you have a bath. Technically, you get a stochastic equation, but everything becomes infinitely easier. Why? Because all the question of ergodicity, chaos, etc., you don't have to deal with it. The noise does it for you. So this is why stochastic uh, thermodynamics, as they call it, is so successful, because you can do things that in ergodic theory would be impossible. Ergodic theory means without noise, you have to explain why the system explores everything. With noise, you saw that we, we saw that the Gibbs measure is, is a stationary thing. This is trivial, two lines. No? You see that the Fokker-Planck or the Kramer operator do it for you. Instead, if you want to show this from Hamilton, pure, without a bath, then it's very, very difficult. One of the very, very few examples is the Sinai billiard I gave you. OK, so that's the, um, so Galagotti and Cohen did the stationary one for a deterministic um, thermostat. When we did the thing with stochastic, the proof went from being, for most people, illegible to being trivial, but we resigned one thing that they did. We resigned the ergodic theory part because by using a bath, we were almost putting it by hand. So it wasn't completely for free. It was a bit cheating. For most people, doing the ergodic theory or doing it with a bath, for many things, it's the same. For other things where you want to prove ergodicity results, no. So, but if you're doing a system like a typically a molecule, DNA or RNA molecule that you're opening like this in water, you, you want a bath. I mean, you are in a bath. What can you do? <laughs> Okay, maybe. Jarsinski uh, is something that starts in equilibrium mostly. So you don't really need a bath, although you can have it. And then there are thousands upon thousands of variants of this. I, I, I gave some in my notes, but there are thousands more. Okay. Um, I will give you a bit more literature if you want to read. There are many things that happen. The problem with the literature is not that there isn't a literature, it's that there is too much. OK. Now, so you agree with me that if I can calculate the G and prove something for the G, then to get something for this quantity, which is the complete probability, is going to be easy. OK, so now I'm going to prove the result for the G that makes the magic of all. Hmm. OK, I'm going to erase this part. history. And now, okay, so now remember that G and this, which was H, are related through, uh, are stand as the microcanonical average to, with the canonical. Okay. So now, uh, the big thing is the following. So I'm going to repeat a formula that uh, we wrote already. If I find it. Mm, 
I will find it eventually, so I get the signs right. Yes. Remember that we did And then I said, and this is the important part, that precisely, this was time reversal, and precisely the violation of uh, time reversal is scalar product, which is the, where I got the sigma from. And all this is evaluated in QE. Here is already the seed of the fluctuations theorem. If you want, this is the relation that will tell us the fluctuation theorem. It all comes from, remember this detailed balance kind of thing, but broken because we had a forcing, and the term, normally I have kind of detailed balance, except that I have to change the sign of P, but it's broken by precisely the entropy production. Okay, from here and the algebra, we get the fluctuation theorem. But the point to understand is that this is the important thing. So, mm. so now, look what G is. In our case, A is going to be F dot B. I did it in general, but the quantity of which I am talking, of which I want the large deviations, is the power. Okay? Uh, I did it with an A so that you saw that what was general, but this is what we want now. Okay? So now I'm going to put here a f dot v, and I'm going to see now a variant of this. How does this guy transform? The complete guy. Here it's a minus, and if something happens with the mu, don't worry. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, why are you changing sign in the exponents? Uh, in the exponents, I change sign. Uh, he, here? Yes, down is, uh, uh, on the right, it's e to ah, the minus. Ah, b. because I made a mistake. Yeah. Um, Mm, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I have slight variation of this. I'm going to conjugate here, so, but it's the same relation, and here I have So, uh, conjugation only changes the sign of this. Uh, sorry, when, when I change the sign, but uh, conjugation does nothing to this. And the only thing I did is I used the result on top for HK, and I just added this term, 
and then it's it's simple how this how this happens. I think it's the signs are good because they are in my notes, uh, pr printed notes this way. But check it. You see, it's nothing. It's just that you transform this one and you transform this one. Transforming this one gives you an extra term, which is this one over here. No, the one that is here, a one. And transforming this one doesn't give you anything, so you get mutants that. There'd be a temperature on the left hand side. Uh, right. oh, yeah. okay. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, so I see that you're a bit lost. I'm going to repeat it. I probably said it in a muddled way. Uh, you do first this piece, and this should be the thing upstairs. Up. And then you add this thing, and it adds this which is basically the same. It, it doesn't do anything to that, OK? So, and here comes the beautiful thing. The violation of uh, time reversal is this guy here. Otherwise, the, the rest is the same. And I am looking, yes? Is there an explanation? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you very much again. And here, of Q minus P. Yes, thank you. It's just the top one. Is it missing in the top one? No. OK, so the important relation that we get here is the following. And this is, with this, we are almost done. If you look at what G of mu does, Because when you put this in the exponent and you time reverse, you can convert it into this, and you will get this equation. And now we're going to do it. You have this here. So so you have this in the, in the exponent, and So you have g e to the t g of mu. This is you start with Gibbs. Then you apply e to the h k minus, let's say, mu f dot v divided by t. And then you go anywhere you like. And now we do the trick that we've done a thousand times. Uh, no, a thousand yesterday we've done a thousand times. We are going to reverse the times and use the, 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 this property of time reversal, which is broken by this term. So now, I apply this thing here. And just like yesterday, this, this will be Gibbs. This will become like this. And now I only have to conjugate what is on top. This is exactly the same trick we did yesterday to get um, to get uh, uh, Onsager. No, I invert the limits and I take the dagger of what is inside. And now I apply this thing here, just like we did yesterday, and so I can substitute by this. So this thing here will be substituted by e to the beta h, e to the minus beta h. And then here, there's going to be this thing here.
check the Onsaga relations, how we did them. We did the same trick, only that we did it with Fokker Planck and we didn't do it with Kramers. But this time we are a bit forced to use Kramer for the reason I told you. And exactly like happened yesterday, this one together with this one gives me the flat measure. And this one together with this one gives me Gibbs. I take the normalization here and I put it here. And now here I get simply the same thing with But this, I look at it, and I recognize that I have this. So I have proven something about the large deviations. Now let us recap all the times necessary, because we are done, basically. What is this system? Ha. Mu is what you would call the, OK, if instead of time we had space, mu would be the temperature. And you would say, I fix the energy, and conjugate to the energy, I have the temperature. Here we are fixing the work in time. This is a bit like doing microcanonical, but in time. And this is the conjugate thing to the work. It doesn't have a name, as far as I know. It is the conjugate Legendre variable. I don't know how you call it. Okay? Or if you want, you can say that this is the Laplace transform of the probability, and this is the Laplace variable. I, I, as far as I know, it doesn't have a name. In thermodynamics, you have volume, and it gives you pressure, and so on. But in, in this sense, where it's time, the thing, uh, Nice, no? It, it can come up. It has to come up. Some non zero problem. Mm -mm. <laughs> Look, it's fluctuating. Okay. So, uh, what have we used? What have we done? Let us assume that I didn't, uh, this one is definitely true. Let us assume that everything I did is correct. So let us recap. This is the kind of detailed balance C thing for grammars. I don't call it detailed balance because people, I don't know if people call detailed balance when you have to change the sign of velocities. But it plays the role of time reversal, and it's morally detailed balance. But the important thing is that it is time reversal. To get a fluctuation theorem, you need a forcing. So this is the Kramer's one with, with a force. No, there's nothing to prove if everything derives from a potential. Now, when you apply detailed balance, there is one thing, uh, sorry, time reversal, that violates time reversal. The trick of constructing a fluctuation theorem is that you have to look at precisely the quantity that violates time reversal and look at the fluctuations of those. Why? Because when you want to construct your large deviation function with a mu, now detailed balance gives you this one and mu is mu. So this is going to give you some sort of symmetry thanks to this breaking of symmetry. And it, it will reflect via this small calculation where I had to use exactly time reversal, exactly as I used it yesterday for the correlations. And I get this one directly. Notice that I used Gibbs to start, which has made it particularly easy because these exponential conspire, like yesterday, to give you the flat measure and Gibbs. And so now we have this. And now it's easy, because remember that if via saddle point, there is a direct relation between this and the probability. 
we will do it in a second, but mm, Okay. And now we go to the integral we had at the beginning. And, and, and now things are very easy. Ah, this thing here for reasons I don't really understand, is usually called the lebowitz spohn uh, relation. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, they used it for sure, but uh, it's something that uh, was there. I mean, it, it's clearly part of the fluctuation theorem. OK. So now we have to go back to our calculation of P. Now it's really very easy. I don't even need to do large times here. This, I don't even need, this is from minus i infinity to plus i infinity. Now, I'm going to use here I'm going to use this famous thing that we derived. But mu is an integration variable. So what I can do is here put 1 minus mu t sigma. Here leave t 1 minus mu, g of t minus mu. But I have done what? I have uh, with a minus. So I get the mu, but I have added that e and this one that I added it without any explanation. So now I have to put it back because otherwise it won't work. And this is minus T sigma with a plus. With a plus. I, this is just a change of variables I'm doing, nothing. And now this integral, because mu is a dummy variable, you could here put 1 minus mu and change the, this is the same integral as this one, but with a change of sign. So, and it's finished. So just by putting inside this famous relation, you're in one second in the thing. If you want to understand the logic of what we've done in a cheap, really cheap example, if you go to my notes, the six notes, there is a little example uh, that I think was done for the first time by Abhishek Dar. I think I took it from him. It's a very simple example where you see how a discrete symmetry that is broken by a term gives you a large deviation relation, just in the easiest possible example. So if you want to check it in a very, very, very easy example, you, you get it there. But the idea, uh, you, you, I hope you followed the idea. Um, it, is, it is very simple. The time reversal property gives you an extra term that breaks it. That extra term, we, we said yesterday, and it was very important, that extra term is the, precisely the entropy production. So you choose that quantity for the large deviations so that the large deviation you're doing gets together 
with the extra term that is breaking, and this is what gives you this relation. Okay? So after this little tour de force, we are in time, sorry, five minutes late, uh, you see that the proof is not terribly complicated. Um, you just have to follow the steps, and of course you don't have so much experience, but it done this way, it was accepted by everybody as something very simple. And, and you have to bear in mind that this is one of the big results of out of equilibrium statistical mechanics, which perhaps will convince you how poor we are of big results and, and the, how small the big results are, but this is what we have. Could you say it again why the minus sign from the change of variable doesn't matter? Ah, because if you change the sign of a variable, there is a Jacobian, but then you change the, the limits and one compensates the other. This is a typical mistake one makes always. Uh, It, it's an integral of a positive function has to give you a probability. So even if you integrate it the other way around, it has to be positive. Who of you think that more or less you followed what we did today? You're not raising your hands convincingly. You're <laughs> doing this. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Anyway. If you like, I can, so my, part of my PhD thesis was an experimental test of the fluctuation. That would be nice. So I can do a, a simple uh, 10 or 15 minute uh, tour of how an experiment would go about testing. That I think would be give, give it flesh. When would you do that? I can do it now if people are willing to skip the coffee. Will no, I think no. No. <laughs> okay, let's do the following. You are supposed to start your uh, presentations at 11, but uh, let's take a 15-minute uh, detour to look at how an, uh, experiments would approach the fluctuation relation. What are the requirements that go in from that side? So this is again in the, in the vein of what I said during my first lecture. Why is it important for a theorist to know about experiments? Why is it important for an experimentalist to know about here? So we reconvene at 11 here. Good. Thank you very much, Mahesh.